Direct Brain Interface Accessibility. The first panel of day two was focused on direct brain interfaces and accessibility. On day one, we heard about advances in DBI. This day two panel looked at the implications of those advances in DBI over the next 20 years, discussing potential new barriers as well as new opportunities that they might provide. Speaker bios are at futureofinterface.org slash bios. So um, my name is Ed Futrell. Uh, I manage the ability team at Microsoft Research. We are a small group of researchers really looking at how to use technology both um, on behalf of and directly usable by people with various kinds of disabilities. And it is my pleasure today to moderate this panel of some really remarkable people looking at brain interfaces. And um, the title of this is Direct Brain Interfaces. And what we're really wanting to do here is to start to pivot not just about the technology of brain interfaces, but thinking about how this can be used sort of for accessibility and for people with disabilities. Um, so uh, the six people on this panel, which uh, hopefully everybody's here, uh, looks like we are, excellent. Um, I will apologize a little bit if I mispronounced folks' names, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, we're gonna start with, uh, um, I'm gonna first off just read off the names of the folks on the panel. Uh, then we're going to have everybody sort of like just speak a little bit about, introduce themselves, who they are, and then we'll just start a discussion. We've got a few questions, and hopefully we'll be able to harvest some awesome questions from uh, uh, folks on the uh, uh, call here. So we'll start with Andreas Forsland. He's from Cognition. Uh, you may have heard from him yesterday afternoon um, in the uh, panel then. Second, we have Aaron Solovey from WPI. This is the Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, Jose Mian from University of Texas at Austin. Martin Pistorius from the Carton Charitable Trust. Um, Sam Michalka from Olin College of Engineering. And then we have Sukle Lu from USC, the University of Southern California. All right, so let's just start maybe with uh, Andreas. If you would like to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name is Andreas Forsland. Uh, I'm, uh, my background is user experience design. Uh, I started my career in 1995, so I've been designing user interfaces uh, for web one, two, and three, and all kinds of interesting novel uh, things along the way. Um, uh, I'm currently working, uh, I'm founder and CEO of a company called Cognition, uh, and we're making uh, XR more accessible. Um, we're designing a headset that combines augmented reality, brain computer interface, and large language models. Um, specifically, it's being designed for people with motor and speech disabilities, uh, such as ALS or stroke or traumatic brain injury, um, as a wearable speech and environmental control device. So that's my background. Excellent. Aaron. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Erin Solovey. Um, I'm an associate professor of computer science at WPI, which is outside of Boston. However, I'm actually in Israel right now for, for the term, um, doing a project center. Um, so, so this is the evening for me. Um, I'm also affiliated with several interdisciplinary programs at WPI, including neuroscience, interactive media and games, bioinformatics and computational biology, and robotics engineering. Uh, my research is in human computer interaction, um, and I do work on brain computer interfaces as well as other kind of emerging interaction techniques. Uh, I, most of the work I do involves dealing with noisy sensors and trying to make some meaning out of them for human computer interaction. So I've done stuff with um, also with textile sensing, radar sensing, uh, and I'm doing some work with VR and AR. Um, but a lot of my work is on brain sensing, particularly with FNIRs, functional near infrared spectroscopy. I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to the panel. Excellent. We'll move on to Jose. Hello, uh, it is a pleasure joining you for today's conversation. My name is Jose Millan. I am a professor at the University of Texas uh, at Austin, both in engineering and in neurology. Most of my work is on BCI based on 
EEG, electroencephalogram, and over almost 30 years now, we have been developing systems for, as assistive technology, in particular brain control robots for different people, and a trend or a, a, an emphasis that my work is taking now is longitudinal studies involving people with uh, uh, severe motor disabilities, uh, where we have been showing that they can learn to control any kind of system, wheelchairs included, and also translating all this work to the realm of neuro rehabilitation, in particular stroke motor rehabilitation. And something fundamental that we have been discovering along this journey is that BCI is not only a new communication and new control um, means, it is that by learning how to use the BCI, people modify volitionally their brain signals, and this leads to brain plasticity, thus recovery. Excellent. Martin. Hello, my name is Martin Pistorius. I have a background in computer science, and I am also a person with a disability and use augmentative and alternative communication to communicate. I have been involved in technology and disability, in particular AC, in some shape or form for about 20 years. Thanks, Martin. Sam. Hi, uh, my name is Sam Mahalka. I am an associate professor of computational neuroscience and engineering at Olin College of Engineering, which is a really tiny engineering school in uh, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, my work kind of falls at the intersection of augmented reality and brain machine interfaces. And more recently, I, my background is in um, auditory and visual neuroscience and sort of understanding how those things interact with each other in the brain. Um, but now I work more on the applied engineering side of things. So how do we build um, interfaces that allow us to interact with augmented reality in the future? Um, and right now I've been working on a project um, to help people use their cell phones without actually getting out their cell phones. So how do you um, do a screen-free interaction with cell phones? So we're working um, both with people who are blind and people who are sighted to explore new ways to interact with those devices. Cool. Before we move on to Sukhle, I've got a request. Um, can the captioner ID the speakers when captioning? So apparently she isn't seeing the messages right now uh, when she's trying to caption. So just a, a request there. Ah, and finally, we come to Sukhle Lu. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Sukhle Lu. I'm an associate professor at the University of Southern California. I'm a neuroscientist and an occupational therapist, so I have a lot of clinical experience working with people who have disabilities, um, as well as in my own research, I focus mostly on stroke rehabilitation using big data sets of MRI data, um, and also trying to develop new technologies to help people with more severe stroke be able to regain uh, sensory motor function. Um, so relevant to this panel, one of our main projects, um, I've been working in brain computer interfaces for about the last decade, and one of the main projects we have is a uh, brain computer interface for people with severe stroke uh, that gives them feedback of their uh, virtual arm moving in virtual reality. And we read out signals from the brain and or the muscles um, so that even if they can't control their, their physical arm, they can control a virtual arm. And this is what we call a closed loop system. So the goal is to reinforce positive brain and muscle signals uh, to eventually help them restore uh, the pathways, the neural pathways from the brain to the muscles so that they don't need the, the BCI anymore um, and can actually regain some motor function. Um, and then I'm also on an NSF grant right now led by my colleague, Dr. Maya Matarik, which is really relevant to this, uh, which aims to help people who have physical disabilities be able to use computer interfaces more fluidly. Um, so the questions of accessibility are really exciting to me and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us. I think this is going to be really cool um, as we start this chat. I want to start out with maybe sort of a scoping question or a question that's around um, how we should actually think about 
this notion of, of brain interfaces. So the name of this panel, which is direct brain interfaces, now this implies that, that there's an interface directly into the brain. But as we've heard yesterday, there's a wide range of ways to think about these kinds of technologies, including sensory interfacing with sensory motor neural pathways outside the brain. Now, if we think about cochlear implants, neuromuscular sensing, stuff like that. Now, the question is, and, and I should say that this also, there's an, a wide range of these things from sort of these more uh, non-invasive techniques like FNIRs and EEG and MEG, all the way into more invasive things like uh, ECOGs and uh, things with deep brain implants and stuff like that. And I just wanted to have a chat here about like, what are the real differences between these techniques, maybe that are more peripheral kinds of stuff? and direct brain interfaces? Or should we think of these all as the same kinds of things as neural technologies? So why don't we start with Andreas? You've uh, raised your hand. <laughs> well, just um, when I first got into the industry um, about almost 10 years ago, um, I had the same thing. I just sort of wandered into the woods and I said, "What? what is here? <laughs> and it, it is amazingly diverse, right? Like the amount of technologies as well as people and solutions or use cases are as diverse as the brain itself, right? So, um, so when you think about this, I've had to kind of reframe and simplify things to say, is it in the body or on the body? <laughs> uh, is, you know, for, for lay people. Um, and Oftentimes, uh, I'm not sure who mentioned it, but but we're really moving into this realm of what we call closed loop, which we can probably articulate better as a group. Um, but uh, historically, most technologies have been either like read or write to the brain. So you have sensors that are picking up and taking data and you're processing that data off the body or out of the body on some other system like a workstation. Um, and then there's other things that are writing to the body that are stimulating it, right? So, so if you sort of think about like, is it in the body, out of the body, and are we reading or writing to the brain? Um, I think it's an easier way to sort of get your head around some of the things that we're all gonna talk about today. Cool, Sukle. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I love that in the body or out of the body, I think uh, also thinking about from an accessibility perspective, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can think about these. The ones that are in the body, you know, for those who are maybe less familiar are typically require surgery. So they're implanted in the brain um, or, or they require, they require something going into your body. And when it's a brain interface, that's pretty, a, a pretty invasive surgery, you know, so uh, you have to actually cut open the skull and then implant electrode arrays onto the actual brain tissue. So there are risks that come with that. Um, the people that typically are willing to get uh, an implanted brain array uh, really need it. Usually, you know, they have a lot of accessibility issues, so it's worth it. The, the cost benefit ratio is worth it. Um, the non-invasive ones are a lot more accessible. You can put them on easily and then you can take them off whenever you want. Um, but the trade-off is that the signals are not as good because we're approximating from populations of millions of neurons, whereas the ones that are implanted, you actually get um, direct readings from the neurons themselves. So um, I think that's kind of the biggest trade-off. And then the other distinction I would make in BCIs is um, kind of like uh, BCIs that help you to do things you can't do anymore. Um, so things like being able to communicate again if you can't communicate uh, versus BCIs that are meant to be um, rehabilitative. So helping to actually train the brain so that you can recover and restore natural cap capabilities to the brain, maybe by training alternative pathways in the brain. Um, so those are kind of two of the main distinctions that I also like to think about with BCIs. Jose. Um, well, let me add a little bit uh, to, to all these uh, very nice uh, framework uh, that um, we have right now, is that um, little by little, uh, the borders uh, between invasive, uh, non-invasive, uh, uh, right, uh, read, are becoming more diffuse. Because if we think in terms of um, having a need of an intervention, and having also the possibility to have a, a broad um, kind of um, pills that you could take from your doctor, the nice thing is that every person will need something different, something that will uh, fit their needs. So the fact that we can have now very invasive deep brain 
uh, implants, uh, cortical implants, semi-invasive because the surgery is very light. We can implant even under the skin um, and then totally peripheral. And in, the, in terms of writing nowadays, we are coupling the decoding with the stimulation at different levels of the central and peripheral nervous system. Yes, as a first approximation, it is good to have those uh, axes, but in practice, we will have a point uh, that is moving along different lines in those uh, multidimensional uh, spaces. Cool, Aaron. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I'll, I I like all of these different ways of breaking it down, um, and I agree these are all considerations. And I'll also add another <laughs> way to think about it. So, in addition to thinking about the hardware focused ones, whether it's um, invasive, non invasive, and whether um, whether it's a direct control or not. Um, when, as someone mentioned, when it, you don't have invasive, the invasive methods, the signal isn't as strong. And so we've started seeing a lot more work also looking at picking up signals, even if they're weak um, and using them, often not as the primary input, but as a supplementary input into a system. So, um, and so that, that has a whole different paradigm where instead of using your brain to directly control something explicitly, where you convert a brain signal into a command or into a control. Um, we're seeing more things where it's used in addition to other methods. So um, you might just pick up the natural signal. So the brain, the cognitive load, uh, workload might be increasing brain activity and you could pick that up. And, you know, that isn't as direct so I don't, again, I, when I saw the name of the panel, I also was thinking, does, does this type of brain sensing and brain interface where you're not directly controlling, but you're using, you are using a brain signal as one of the inputs into the system, that it's a, just a different paradigm um, and sometimes can be useful, particularly when the signal isn't as strong because you also have other methods. But then it does bring, when we get into accessibility, it brings into both positive and negative aspects of accessibility because it means that all the accessibility issues that um, exist with other interfaces. So if you're using a brain signal plus a, a typical mobile device or a uh, graphical user interface, you have all the accessibility issues that might come with those as well as all the, the opportunities that we've seen with those interfaces. And then you add in you know, uh, the, what you're getting from the brain. So it's just another, um, another dimension to put into the frameworks of, mm -hmm. of the types of brain computer interfaces we're talking about. Cool, how about Sam? Yeah, thanks. Um, I wanna build on something that Aaron was saying, thinking a little bit more about um, as we build more brain machine interfaces, uh, having those be context aware is another dimension of this. So um, combining this with sensors like cameras or audio sensors to um, take into account the environment that you're in opens up all kinds of um, all kinds of questions about privacy uh, as well as um, some really powerful information about how your brain is reacting um, and that opens the door for uh, systems that can um, react to your individual situation and the way that your brain or body is responding to something and so this question of like direct brain machine or direct interface within the brain or um, some of these more peripheral sensors. I think it really comes down to what it is that we're trying to measure and finding the least invasive way to build something that provides whatever it is that someone needs. So in some cases, maybe that maybe the only way to provide what a person needs is through like direct brain stimulation. Um, so there's all kinds of research on that. And for other people, if it's a like a more casual interface or maybe a more context aware things, perhaps we can get that information from measuring the brain directly. And perhaps we could also get that information from measuring things more on the periphery. Cool, that makes sense. Andreas, you had a, another comment there. 
um yeah and maybe i'm just the caboose on this train here <laughs> so uh you know sort of finishing off this sort of framing topic um uh is also i think i think the dbi that we're, we're using the acronym dbi and i think it's a, a bit of a narrowly scoped acronym dbi is direct brain interface which is historically you know on the cortical surface so that's an implant um where what we're here talking about is the full breadth of what we mean by brain computing or or otherwise known as affective computing, right? So you're trying to, affect. Um, but uh, another lesson which we saw yesterday in Max Hodak's, uh, he flashed a slide which showed the entire nervous system, right? And so thinking about not just the central nervous system, which is the brain, which is what, what we all think about, um, such as things on your head, uh, but all the way from your midbrain, all the way down your spine, out to every single organ and appendage, right? You have a very robust nervous system called your peripheral nervous system. And so that combination between central and peripheral nervous system is also kind of the landscape that we're working in as, as I guess, a panel. Um, and there's an abundance of technologies that can be used not just on the head, but on the body. So you have things like EMG or pulse oxygen, you know, there's, there's blood flow, there's magnetic uh, signals, there's electrical signals, there's a, a lot of information there's movement um you know so emg is becoming quite popular um as a potential way in for uh, accessibility so i think as we're talking about accessibility and brain computing i would sort of air to also look at the full nervous system right because that's really what we have access to um, and how you can personalize access methods or interaction models um, that are right for the person so if somebody is quadriplegic well, your peripheral nervous system, right, EMG is probably not going to be very useful, um, where you might want something that's more attuned to central nervous system or electro electrooculography or something else, right? Um, so just something for us to sort of think about the breadth of the full mind body. So it's, it's interesting, you know, to, to hear you describe that. It sounds like you would, would actually broaden us out to far more just general physiological fencing, um, where, you know, I mean, in, you know, in the, in the field, you have sort of some of the folks that are really focused on BCI is like they're it's the brain and that's what they're, they really yeah, yeah, care it, about. There's, there's like a religion. Uh, it's like because it's like a it's like a faction, right? You have yeah, you have sort of purists, and then you have people who are practical people in the field that are trying to translate things into useful everyday applications. And so I think, yeah, you know, when it, when I when I look at I think most of of you folks' work, it really seems to be far more of like, well, what can we do that's going to actually help people and be useful, uh, and that may include stuff that's a brain, hopefully. I mean, in this case, uh, but it doesn't really matter. It's like, can you actually get things done uh, for folks? Uh, Jose, well, I don't want to uh, appear as a purist, but um... <laughs> go for it. <laughs> But um, at least the, the, the idea that I had in mind when I was invited to this panel is what can we do for people with severe disabilities? Mm -hmm. And when we come that far, well, there are not too many options. We need to go to the brain. And actually, the acronym DBI or the expression direct brain interface has nothing to do historically with implants. It is how can we directly take a brain signals and to transform them into control actions. Um, so it, it encompasses um, both implanted and, and non-invasive. So something that I would like to highlight is that um, our experience shows that, um, yes, we could extract many contextual information um, from brain signals that will tell us, for example, the level of fatigue of the person so that eventually we can say, okay, time out, uh, you better go to bed for today because there is no much more information that we can get from your brain uh, or from your peripheral signals, depending on what uh, signals you are using. But the important thing is that if you don't provide feedback on these um, signal that you are using as um, contextual information or direct information, people will not be aware that those signals are being used. And if you are not aware that a particular way of conveying information is reaching the receiver, just stop sending. 
And this is technically called operant conditioning. So we need to close the loop, no matter what you are sensing, uh, cognitive states, affective states, direct commands that the person wants to convey, you need to close the loop somehow for the person to be aware of that and to learn how to modulate those symbols. It's useful, thank you. Uh, Sukli, if we can do quickly, because I'd like to move on to some other topics here, but, but continue, yes. please. Of course, yeah. I just wanted to hop on to what people have said, because we actually found in our work that um, because we have a brain and muscle, we had a brain computer interface that read brain signals, muscle signals, gave feedback in VR and haptic feedback in these handheld controllers. And then we wanted people to take it home and we found that it wasn't accessible at all. And what we could do though, was just take the muscle signal because in people where there's a descending pathway from the brain to the muscles, the muscle signal was enough. And so now we just have a version that's just muscle uh, reading out and uh, it, it approximates the brain signals and it gives feedback just on a laptop computer screen. So I just wanted to point out, you know, there's all sorts of technology we get super fancy and we can also make it uh, really toned down. And as an OT, I think I like to go towards the lowest tech version um, that people can actually use. So I just wanted to add that. Well, that's a, that's a nice segue into, into, I think the next question here, which is really, um, if we're thinking about how people who might actually really benefit from these technologies. The question really is, what are some of the biggest barriers that you think for these people to overcome in order to actually use the technologies? Like, what do we need to do to get people to actually be able to use them? Uh, Sukli, you, yeah. you, <laughs> you were I'll quick just, on the draw. <laughs> I'll just continue because uh, the biggest barrier that we found is that people can't put on the technology by themselves. Um, so when we work with people who have physical disabilities, uh, in our case, people who have severe stroke and they don't have the use of one arm, they can't put an EEG headset on by themselves and get good signals from it. They need two hands or they need somebody to help them. Um, so that's why we moved to the EMG because it's something that they can strap on one-handed by themselves. Uh, and then the same with the VR. The VR headsets weren't easy to put on uh, by themselves, so we use a screen. So I think. The biggest barrier that we see is just the ability to put the equipment on uh, in a way that gets the right signals um, so it's useful. Sam. Sure, I think, I think that's a great one and I'm, I'll add a couple more. So I think in addition to that, there's really uh, a, a question of value. So what is the value provided? Um, and that incorporates like how effective is this? So lots of things right now are kind of in the like, this is a cool demo in the lab state, but not a, I'm gonna go through the inconvenience of wearing this device all day. Um, I think there's a big social acceptability and stigma question here. Um, so what is it What is it like to wear on any device um, that draws attention to you out in public um, as, long, as well as just like a, a comfort question? Great. Jose. Um, yeah, the, these are definitely barriers, but um, I would like to insist on this process that is required for people to really benefit from a, a BC. We cannot pretend that you uh, set up a system and you start controlling devices, sophisticated devices, or regaining control of your own body. There is a learning process because we need to reroute damages in our central nervous system in order to make those signals reach the periphery on to re or to relearn how to modulate uh, areas of our brain that have been damaged so that an external device can take. So this means that uh, before we can reach uh, people's home, we need to have a process where we train people to use those systems so that afterwards they may become um, independent in their use. Um, and we have been doing that uh, over the years. And this, the only solution is to, um, to, to, to make alliances with uh, those institutions that are serving um, our end users, so people with disabilities, locally, so that we go there, we train those uh, experts um, in, in those um, environments so that afterwards they train 
the, uh, the end users. The other thing is um, non-invasive technology is great. I have been working mainly with those uh, all my life, uh, but yet they have a, a fundamental limitation and disadvantage as compared to an implant. An implant is there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The day we manage to have the same permanent um, technology non-invasively means that you can then take care in preparing the setup. And for that, you will have an expert. And then people can take it home and use it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, I am not saying that we are there yet, but in particular uh, at the UT Austin with colleagues, we are working on new EEG uh, systems based on new materials that can remain at least for several weeks operational permanently. And this is the time frame, for example, for neuro rehabilitation that takes a few weeks as, a, as, a, as an intervention. Uh, Andreas. Um, <laughs> we could talk for two hours on barriers. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it depends. So if you're talking like the bigger picture, right, we're talking about could BCI be used by 8 billion people, right? So there's that barrier right and but then there's um which is mass market or mainstream and then you look at restoration right so rather than just as a everyday object for everyone thinking about at or assistive technology um the barriers are more narrow uh and achievable but they're still complicated so i think some of the barriers have to do with the actual user um but many of the barriers are outside of the user or beyond the user um so things like can I even get a device nearby? Can I try it before I buy it? You know, where are you going to go find a BCI, right? You're going to have to go into a lab. <laughs> um, you know, you can't just go to Best Buy and go pick up a BCI. It's not that easy. Um, so I think access to options that are available, um, either in lending libraries or other places for non-invasive, or if there's a way to simulate it uh, for invasive, um, those things aren't there to try before you buy. Um, I think when you do get your hands on I work in non-invasive, um, but we also are, have partnerships and friendships with uh, a lot of the invasive companies. Um, you know, uh, comfort is super important, right? So, so long duration wear. So if somebody's going to use a device such as a BCI, um, they're not gonna use it for a one hour session. They're gonna wanna use it throughout the waking day. Uh, and so thinking about the waking day, if you wanna use a BCI for daily active living, then you have all kinds of human factors, considerations that you need to make. Um, and I think there's an OT on here. So understanding positioning. So a lot of the individuals with severe disabilities often have positioning challenges, um, difficulty holding their bodies in certain positions. Um, so as you think about their ability, their body drifts, like if you think about drift of the body in a wheelchair or in a bed or some other kind of um, mobility uh, situation, um, you also have the devices drift, right? So your sensors tend to drift, you have motion artifacts, you have all kinds of things that are not perfect. <laughs> so, um, and you even have an, an invasive, right? So if you have an implant and you have a craniotomy to have an implant put on your cortical surface, like an ECOG or something, even that drifts, right? You're having, you're essentially having a sensor that's on a jello mold, you know? So there's still movement inside of your skull uh, so things tend to drift um, and I, I think we talked earlier about how um, the repeatability of the pattern recognition so the data sets are for training these models there's not enough of them uh, available for training data because the learning curve is quite long to learn how to use a bci so understanding how you can reduce the time it takes to learn how to use a bci and increasing the repeatability of success that somebody is successful um, doing it over and over again in developing that new sense or that new capability is super important so that's i think uh, another one of the barriers is um, most bci today are designed purely as read only and you're charting data off the brain um, i think some of the folks here are exploring um, secondary uh, biofeedback such as haptics or audio or other kinds of visual feedback um, and so if you can time synchronize all of that biofeedback um, 
you tend to learn faster, right? So there's this orchestration that has to happen in order for BCIs, I believe, to be successful. Um, users need to be able to learn it quickly. They need to be get it, able to don it and doff it quickly. Um, and then lastly, the unspoken heroes are the caregivers, right? So the caregiver needs to be, because if the caregiver who has to don a device on a patient um, isn't really comfortable with it, then they're not going to do it. And if they don't do it, then it just gets in a, it goes put, put it in a shelf, right? So um, ultimately you need to also think about the user experience or interfaces for the caregiver to be successful. This is great, great stuff. I'm going to skip over you, Aaron, just for a moment to, to touch on Martin here, because we haven't heard from him yet. And as mentioned, the practical aspects of using them, but also you find with systems that need someone to help you is you train one person who supports them and that person leaves. So you start again. So you almost need it to be more intuitive. And I think cost is also a barrier, at least when you're talking about actually get someone to use it. This is a great point. I think this gets back to Andres's comment there, especially at the beginning about caregivers and the importance of that connection there. But but absolutely. Aaron. And, if, and, if, and I think what yeah, Martin's yeah. talking about is affordability, right? Like many yes. of these things, you, you sort of hit this threshold of how much will somebody spend for technology out of pocket? Um, versus relying on other payers such as insurance or other kinds of things that require more money to to create not just not just to procure the device but to procure the supports around the device and the warranties and other things um, these kinds of systems aren't cheap yet um, and so you can get a cheap bci but you get what you pay for um, more or less you really have to you know owner beware <laughs> uh, Right. And, you know, I would I would say that, you know, th then when you quickly get into the the weird uh, vicissitudes of, for instance, American uh, healthcare systems and support for disability and all that kind of stuff, which, well, we, we could go on and on about about mm -hmm. some of that kind of nonsense. But to Aaron. Um, yes, I'm shifting a bit from yes. the, um, from what we've been talking about and taking a slightly different angle. So, um, you know, the question you were asking is what barriers could these direct brain interfaces or brain computer interfaces create for people with disabilities? And so coming from the non-purist BCI view, where um, if you think, if you can believe that in the future, maybe um, BCIs are widely used across diverse users and, um, and aren't specifically designed. So there's the ones specifically designed for particular impairments and things like that. But now we're starting to see all this emergence of BCI for video games, for people at work. Um, and so if there's, if that future happens, um, a question, I, the way I was thinking about it is what, what, will, what will be some of the barriers when, for people with disabilities? So this is a different view of BCIs. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think there's a few issues that I see with that. Um, one is just the general issue that we have across all brain computer interfaces, which is that we, to have accurate brain computer interfaces, we need a lot of data. Um, and a lot of these rely on machine learning models of co to convert some brain signal into some something meaningful. And if those data sets of brain signals are coming not from people with different, um, different backgrounds and different cognitive abilities and different diverse um, abilities in general, then these brain, brain computer interfaces just might not work well um, for people who have disabilities. So that's, so I think as with all machine learning based <laughs> systems, we know that we really need to build these huge diverse data sets in order to make them work. And that includes people with disabilities. Um, and then another issue I was thinking about in that future of everyone having a brain computer interface, um, another issue might be that some conditions might become more evident when we connect directly into the brain that maybe hadn't been obvious or people could get by and not have to have to um, disclose that it, but then when we have this brain signal um, coming, it might expose particular um, you know, cognitive issues or other, just other mental health issues could come along with the signal 
um, that we're getting in these. So it, these are just some views of if direct brain interfaces or brain computer interfaces are used by a wide amount of people, you know, what will that mean for people with disabilities? Well, well that's great. This, uh, this is actually uh, probably the next question I was going to ask is really about this notion of, um, you know, what does this mean for people if, if these things are used by a lot of people without disabilities, what might this happen for people with disabilities, the kinds of barriers that might come up? And so what I heard you say, and I'm gonna just try to reframe it a little bit. So the first thing had to do a little bit with this notion of the, the disability data divide mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the notion that as we're building large machine learning models, we have to make sure that we actually get a, appropriately uh, representative data sets of all these different people and people can get left out um, and that's happening in all kinds of places where where machine learning is dependent on that but then the second point you made there was really i think questions about privacy and about the way in which accidental or indirect disclosure might actually happen for folks and, and and I think those are those are really good concerns I, I don't know what other people on the panel have some some thoughts on this question Yes, Jose. Well, definitely I share 100%, uh, if not more, this issue that um, most of the research done today uh, in the field of BCI is conducted on, on people without disabilities. And, uh, and this doesn't generalize necessarily to people with. And not because um, their brain is damaged or whatever, because a fundamental principle of BCI is that uh, uh, you will pick up whatever signal the person, the individual person can modulate that and to, to transform it into a command. So this is not the main principle. The main principle is that many of the interfaces are designed to work for people without attentional lapses, without uh, muscular fatigue, ocular um, uh, degeneration, and, and people with disabilities may suffer from one or several of these conditions. So, and, and then I want to, 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 to make the point that the brain computer interface and the coding in particular is only one brick in the whole system. This is a complex system whenever you are interacting with something. So human factors, how you design the interface as a whole, how you will be providing feedback, et cetera, et cetera. These have to be designed for a specific categories so, because otherwise they cannot use it. Not because they cannot generate brain signals, but because they are lost. Thank you. Uh, Andreas. Um, I think we work with hundreds and hundreds of people with disabilities uh, in testing some of the work that we're doing. And um, ironically, privacy is a very, it's a very uh, edge case. Like most folks, the, the utility of what someone gets far outweighs the risk of privacy. What we see is most commonly, if, if, if it's very clear and available for the user to understand, like there's transparency and disclosure to say, I'm opting in to share certain information in exchange for utility, it's the opaqueness of these decisions, which I think is really um, off-putting. Uh, so as long as the user or the person that's responsible for the user uh, is clear uh, around what the trade-offs are, then normally that stuff is a non-issue. Um, when, it, uh, yeah, so I think also um, what's interesting from, a, I'm just trying to provide fodder for, the possibilities um, of what's ahead. A lot of um, uh, you could you have opportunities for passive and active BCIs, right? So thinking about um, you could have BCIs that are just reading out data over time, and you're just looking at data visualization, right? So what's an interface for just doing data visualization, and that doesn't really require any. Thing, right you don't have to be volitionally trying to control anything per se you're just doing your thing and you're just reading out what's happening with your brain state um, then there is sort of a sliding scale of how real time and how accurate does something need to behave as an active controller um, and so there's you know you've got different ways of kind of getting there but 
there are ceilings, there's sort of caps and thresholds around what you should expect to be able to do with say EEG versus an ECOG. I mean, they're, they're radically different uh, regarding the, the resolution and the speed. Um, you're talking about single neuron level sensing versus like <laughs> seeing the Golden Gate Bridge through a foggy day, right? <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's quite different, you know? Um, and so, you know, and thinking about different ways to find that if you're looking for a real-time control signal, um, you've got a variety of ways to do it. I think many of these folks are doing motor imagery or other kinds of techniques for understanding how you're volitionally trying to move something, move your body, move a kick, you know, kick your leg, swing your arm, things like that, um, uh, versus, um, evoke potentials or event related potentials, right? Where you might have external stimuli um, that you're injecting signals into the brain or into the body and you're seeking to, to parse that synthetic signal out of the natural BCI data, uh, which is much faster, but it's also more fatiguing, right? So there's all these trade-offs in the interface between trying to do passive brain sensing, um, you know, highly active, highly fa you know, like fast responsive control signals, uh, volitional versus um, evoked. Uh, and then another thing I would also think about is that there are <clears throat> there are systems that, like most of the BCIs that I that are in the market today that you can go buy, um, are mostly um, designed for things like meditation, for sleep. Um, you know, so you're thinking about using the data from the BCI for for decision making and behavior change. Uh, and so you sort of think about that from a wellness perspective or a health and well-being perspective, um, mindfulness, yoga, things like that, um, mental state, calming yourself. Uh, and so um, those, are, those don't really require high speed, powerful systems. They can be done with off the shelf microcontrollers and um, cheap electronics basically uh, because you're dealing with slow wave processing don't require big batteries uh, a lot of capacity um, whereas if you really want say a bci that you could use in a fighter pilot's helmet to to be a third arm to make decisions you need something that's pretty pretty powerful pretty fast you know so so thinking about your use cases um, i think you know I do envision that in the next 10 to 20 years, we're gonna have an abundance of, of novel new use cases and you're gonna see people out in the field, out in the real world using BCIs um, that don't look like swim caps uh, with electrodes with wires hanging off of them. Um, uh, but you know, I think um, it's gonna mostly be in the realm of business to business or industry uh, research, medical, I think is really gonna work where we're gonna see most of that uh, in the next 20 years. Too clean. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of piggyback off of something that Aaron had said about making sure that we have a diverse representation in the machine learning models. Uh, on top of that, I think when people use BCIs, typically you have a calibration step where you try to calibrate and read in whatever that person's unique brain signals are and then uh, use that to provide the feedback or whatever you're doing. Um, and I think that we have to be very aware of making sure that the calibration step um, is accepting of diverse signals um, for what people want to do. Um, I think that goes back to what Aaron said about making sure that we have a baseline that is diverse um, so that we kind of have a range that we're looking for that's within each person's capability. Otherwise, we've done a lot of research on implementa like implementation science and like how do we implement the BCIs in people's homes and what are barriers to people actually using them in their homes. Uh, and the biggest thing is that if the calibration fails, they don't want to use it um, and they don't have a way to fix that part. So I think it's something just to be aware of. Yeah, I mean, as a, as a follow up to that, we've seen the same kind of thing with eye tracking. And whenever you're using eye tracking within the um, this kind of, I mean, it's, you know, that's maybe one step shy of direct brain interface, but we are now using sort of eyes for a thing that they're not really used to using, which is direct interaction. Um, so yeah, I no, that's, a, that's a great point. Yes, Andrea. I'm just I'm going to try to be really short because Martin has his hand up, so I'm going to try and just slip this in. But on that point, um, ironically, most of what we're talking about here is is digital experiences and digital interfaces. But ironically, the weakest link in the chain for BCI is the analog, right? It's the actual mm -hmm. electrode to body contact, which is the 
that's the, that's the make or break essentially for all BCI systems is how good is the biocompatibility and the impedance and some of the characteristics of the actual sensor itself. That's a, that's a great point. Martin. Yes, agree. The only thing I would add to what Andrea said about privacy is more confidentiality. For example, were I to use a BCI to speak and that is being logged, I would want to be able to turn the log off for a moment if I want to say something private. I, that point was made yesterday as well, and I think that's a really critical element of the difference between privacy and confidentiality. That that's really about user control and um, and then that that notion of ownership of what you say, what you do, what your data is. Um, I think I think that's that's a really important point. And if I could tag on to what Martin's saying, because uh, we also the ability to to purge data off of mm. systems, either selectively or take the nuclear approach to just blast out like your history over the last the last statement or the last day or the last week, the ability to actually have controls for destroying um, any of that data is really important. Great point. All right, we'll go to Jose and then I'm going to move on to our thing, hopefully maybe last couple of questions if we can. So yes, Jose. Well, um, I, I want to, 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 to break a, a myth that uh, the solution to BCI is better technology, better machine learning, and better, better, better. And we don't realize that uh, you may have the best possible electrode ever, but if you don't implant it or you don't uh, position it in the right spot, it is useless. So the, the point I want to make here is again, insisting that there is a learning process that you cannot tell people, we will make the magic calibration session and you will start controlling your BCI immediately. No, there is a learning process because all what we need to achieve is that given the position of that electrode, you exploit the signals around that, that may be very weak at the very beginning. And it is because of the user learning through feedback to modulate them that it will become a stronger and more stable over time. And this is our experience. Our people, severe disabilities, more than 300 today. I am not claiming that everyone reach a perfect control, but all of them reach a certain level of control. All right, so I'm gonna bring up a, a question that I think several people have, have mentioned in chat and yesterday came up a couple of times. And so um, many of the technologies we hear about using neural interfaces of various sorts are focused on sensory motor interaction, things like cochlear implants or um, you know, things like deep brain implants for people with motor neuron diseases like ALS and um, stuff like that. But yesterday we heard people talking about things like mood regulation, about cognitive function, um, you know, depression, OCD, anxiety, or maybe attentional control of systems or contextual understanding, cognitive load. And I'm wondering how we should think about this variety of applications and what are some of the challenges associated with them? Because now we're getting into things that are less about directly affecting the world out there or understanding the world, but about processing and the way that we're interacting with it. And also transitioning from things that are maybe more sort of um, direct interaction, but even the way we feel about it or you know, um, the way we understand the world. Well, what do folks think? Yeah, so be. Yeah, so um, you know, before I started working with EEG, I did a lot of real-time fMRI neurofeedback. And the difference with that is that you can actually read signals across the entire brain, including subcortical structures, deeper structures in the brain. Um, and there, there's a lot of real-time fMRI neurofeedback applications for things like anxiety, depression, uh, addiction, actually. So um, learning to control some deeper brain structures that may impact the, um, your addictive uh, feelings. Um, and so I think it's definitely possible. You know, the reason I moved from the real-time fMRI to EEG is because it wasn't very accessible and I couldn't see patients going to an MRI machine all the time. Um, but that said, I, I do think that what Jose says also has a lot of merit. And I think a part of also what he might be saying is that we have to clearly understand the neural circuits that we're trying to affect and read out from before we can change the behavior. 
And so I think a reason that BCIs have traditionally been on sensory motor uh, capabilities is that those are pretty clear input output systems. I mean, there's still a lot that we don't know, but we know the primary motor cortex or primary visual cortex pretty well. When it comes to something like higher level cognition, like my mood or, you know, like I can't tell you what the entire neural circuitry of the brain is that makes you feel sad or makes you feel disappointed. Um, those are very complex neural signals. And I think uh, first understanding what the neural signals are and then being able to control them or provide feedback of them uh, is a little is more complicated. And so I think it's possible that we could get there in the future, but I think we need the basic science research to understand how the brain impacts those behaviors before we can create a DBI to uh, directly interface on this. So if I were to restate maybe what you just said is, well, first we need to understand the neuroscience before we can do something about it. Um, yes, it's like you. we just don't, we don't get what the brain is doing deeply enough to be able to really affect it. Yes. That's, a, that's a really good point. Jose. Well, I definitely agree with this statement, but reality is a little bit nuanced because for example, uh, something that is having a big impact today, is especially for Parkinsonian patients, but also or, or it's, um, people with anxiety, obsessive disorders, is deep brain stimulation. And uh, the reality is that we don't understand how deep brain stimulation is working. We don't understand why we need to uh, stimulate in that area. It is very engineering-like. You try something, it works fine. It doesn't work, move on. Um, so I think that that the reality is that uh, we need to, to 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 combine several fronts together. And clearly, this is the role also of IRB committees that says, no, 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 you don't go wild. You need to have at least a good hypothesis to, to attempt to, to do that. Because most of these um, um, cases or conditions are treated not by asking people to learn to self-regulate uh, broken or pathological rhythms across different areas. It is a they are based on a stimulation. So here we are reading, writing, because the new protocols are based on closed loop stimulation. You detect a pathological pattern in a given part of the brain, and then you stimulate, not necessarily over there, you can stimulate elsewhere in order to, to, to attempt to, 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 to adjust and make those patterns more healthy. Very good, thank you. All right, last question. I think this will, because um, I think we're nearing the end of, of our uh, time here. And this is, I think, getting a little bit down to, to both looking forward, but also sort of where the rubber meets the road, as it were. And I'm just wondering, like, what kinds of um, barriers for people with disabilities do you think neural interfaces will be most important for addressing going forward? What are you most excited about for the potential of these kinds of technologies for enabling people with disabilities? Where's the, where's the, where are we going? Sam. Sure. I think one of the things that I'm most excited about looking into the, the future is this idea of customizability of interfaces for an individual based on their needs and um, what they want to do. And so I'm excited about systems that can adapt with a person to become their assistant to uh, help them do what they want to do while also understanding how where they're at at a particular state of time and that can change um, both in the short term i'm in this condition or i'm in that condition it can also change uh in the long term as we all age and mm -hmm. that's even more profound when you have a degenerative disease so i'm really excited about that 